So it's my second slide on matrix representation, and I call it number two. So this is a slide which will be given in the, in the context of the general couple of vector spaces. So imagine I have quadruple V plus dot and F for one vector space and quadruple W plus dot F for the other vector space. So imagine we have two vector spaces. In order to present the matrix representation theorem, I will need to fix two bases, one of them in, in the space V and one of them in the second one in the space W. Here they are. I'll use these notations. V1, V2, Vn will be the set of vectors, which is the basis in V. And C, uh, sorry, W1, W2, Wm will be the basis in W. So dimension of V is assumed to be N for Nicholas, and dimension of W is assumed to be M for Mary. And now I have a linear map between these two. For this linear map, there will be a version of matrix representation theorem, even though, even though my V and W, they have nothing to do with N tuples or M tuples of scalars, you still can reproduce a matrix representation theorem for this setting, and that's what you do for that. In order to give you the this uh, matrix representation theorem, I have to recall two other notions from Tuesday. On Tuesday, we uh, on Tuesday, we actually introduced two mappings of particular interest. One of them I call like this, J sub B. It's a mapping which is attached to bases. In this context, it's a basis B. And that's a mapping which does this. It just it takes n tuples of scalars and produces a vector in the vector space V. That's how it acts. J sub B, if you apply it to an n tuple, x1, xn, the result will be simply the linear combination of elements of the basis with these coefficients, x1 and xn. We proved, actually a few times, well, not, not on Tuesday, we proved, we proved it even before that, that this is a linear map. That's one linear map I will need. The second linear map was the something we I introduced on Tuesday. It was the inverse of this linear map. And I, that's something which I called I sub C. So actually, it, it is not the inverse of the JB because the basis is different here, but it's a it's a inverse of the similar J sub C map, but we don't need that map. So that's the map which acts in the opposite direction. You see, it, it acts from W to F M. You, I don't, we don't have the explicit form or the explicit formula for this for this map, but effectively that's the map which does this. It takes a vector. W and produces the M tuple of coordinates of that vector with respect to the given basis. We discussed this map on Tuesday quite extensively. In particular, we proved that this map is a linear map. Now look what I'm going to do. Here's my setting. Here's my vector space V and here's my vector space W, right? In my setting, I have a map T which takes vectors from V to W. Now, in the same setting, I'm going to introduce now these two maps. What do they do? They do this. JB takes the M N tuples to V space, right? That's, that's the way the JB acts, right here. And on the other hand, I sub C acts here. Right? It just takes the elements from W to FM. That's a sort of a diagram which we are observing right now. I introduced three different maps. One of them was quite arbitrary, this T. These two, they touch to the bases involved, B and C. Here's my maps. And now the key, the key thing in understanding the matrix representation of arbitrary linear map is it comes now. What we're going to do now, we're going to combine these three maps as one map. It's something which I call composition of maps on Tuesday. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to build, take a new map here, which I will call S, which will act directly from here to here via this detour. So in my 
uh, formal language, my S, it's a map which takes Fn to Fm. And it, it acts like this. It's a composition of these three maps together. Remember, I use a circle to say, to denote the composition of linear maps. Now, what I'm about to say is this. Well, actually, I can give you the very expressed version how the S acts. Just to, I mean, the, the way we expand composition, we do this. We apply IC. Well, we have an expression like this. So X from this Fn is first taken by JB here, and then taken by T into W, and then taken by IC to Fn. That's how, that's how my that's how my S works. Now, first thing I want to say about this S is that S is a linear map. It's a very easy consequence of our discussions on Tuesday, because we know that each individual component here is a linear map. The i and j components, that, that's something we proved. The middle component, just because we assumed that. And we also proved with you on Tuesday that when you compose linear maps, the result will be a linear map. So my S is a linear map. That's the first observation I'd like to make. The second observation I'd like to make is that this new linear map S, it now acts between very familiar couple of vector spaces. It's no longer some arbitrary V and some arbitrary W. It's just very particular N tuples and M tuples. For such maps, we just had another matrix representation theorem, the one which I just showed at the beginning of the lecture. Every such map, every map which acts between these two, it's a matrix multiplication map. We don't know anything yet about the maps between arbitrary couple of spaces, but linear maps between these two, they are always matrix multi with something we just proved in the, in the, on the slide. Well, we proved it on Tuesday, but I showed you this at the very beginning of today's meeting. And that's what I'm going to say now. By matrix representation theorem, That's the one which was shown to you very first today. What can I say? That I have a matrix of a particular size such that this newly constructed S is simply matrix multiplication, linear map. And now all I have to do, I have to reflect it back to my, how it will reflect back on T. So my T will be matrix multiplication combined with the inverse of this and the inverse of this. Right, so what I'm saying is that uh, if I just introduce a vector y, which is the image of x under the JB mapping, so y, y lives in here, and that's the image of some x in here, and, well, that's the relation between x and y, x basically the coordinates of the y vector with respect to the b basis, then my the coordinates of the action of t on y with respect to the c basis, which is effectively s of x. This is my matrix multiplication by A. This matrix A we have just constructed, and we, we truly constructed it. If you remember, I just I said it twice already today that this matrix A, which appears here, you, you, we not only we know that such a matrix exists all the time, we also know how to build that such a matrix. I just, give, I just did an example on the previous slide how to build such a matrix. This matrix it has a particular name and notation. That's the notation we're going to use. It will be linear map symbol T in brackets, and we have two subscripts here indicating the basis, because obviously this matrix depends on the choice of a basis. Different basis brings different matrices. And that's the one which we're going to call matrix of T with respect to basis B in the domain and basis C in the co-domain. Is a symbol for such a matrix. That's the name for such a matrix. There will be, that, well, that's just a piece of terminology. Okay. If you don't have any questions, uh, I want to just take uh, the second part of the theorem, of the theorem I showed you first today, that not only that the matrix exists, but we know how to build such a matrix. I want to see how this reflects back on T. Back on T, if you want to see how to construct this matrix for arbitrary T, you have to do something like this. I have to bring this up a little bit. 
by the same matrix representation theorem, MRT, your A matrix by the MRT, by the example, and by the example I just did, this A matrix uh, is just a matrix which composed out of the out of the action of my S on the standard basis vectors as columns. But S itself, it's not like the main map we are interested in. It's a derivative map. So I'd like to just frame this in the, in the, in the context of the map T. And if I want to do that, I should say something like this. Well, E1, E2, EN here, it's a standard basis in, in FN. I think I, I, I have to lift it a little bit further up. S of EJ, if you just use this piece, this is this expression. Uh, J, action of J on the standard basis vector EJ, that's, that's how J acts, you see. If you put here the standard basis vector, so the vector which carries unity in the Jth position and zero in the rest of the positions, this expression will just deliver you the Jth element of the B basis, so that's how it's going to that's how it's going to look. And so what I'm saying is that the jth column of the matrix we're going to look for, it's simply the coordinates of the action of T on the jth element of the basis in the domain with respect to the basis in the codomain.